So Jacob Stitcher N. Um, everyone knows who Jacob Stitcher N is, but uh, who is Jacob Stitcher N? Where did you come from? Well, you know, I'm the little farm worker, migrant worker that uh, grew up in the San Joaquin Valley. Uh, I grew up in a migrant camp, and you know, my address CPC Camp Number Twelve. You know, so you know, I uh, I was in the trenches. I've been in the trenches all my life as uh, as a farm worker, uh, but you know, getting out of there, I always had dreams. You know, I was picking cotton or, or, or picking tomatoes or peaches and, and during all that work you always, everybody has dreams, right? So that gave me a whole lot of time to work, think of what I wanted to do. Uh, baseball was the thing that I wanted to do and uh, I walked into Merced College which was a town about nine miles away but I had no transportation so I practiced with them for a while and I just got up and joined the Air Force and uh, it got me out of the San Joaquin Valley. <laughs> First time I'd ever been in an airplane and uh, this was in 1974, they stationed me in Thailand and I always wanted to be in training in the martial arts. Bruce Lee was a big thing there. And uh, so I studied uh, in Thailand and uh, that's what got me here. What did you study in Thailand? Okay. Uh, well, I started off in Taekwondo. You know, the Koreans were there for the GIs and all that. And then once the Koreans left, the Thais took over and uh, he was still on contract as Taekwondo, but they kind of transitioned us into the Muay Thai system. And, uh, you know, I was certified as a crew, which, uh, which was great. And when I got back, I, uh, I got into boxing to improve my hands. Uh, at King's Gym and uh, trained amateur fighters there and then uh, I moved out to the suburbs in Fairfield and I opened up my school of kickboxing, uh, ASK, the American School of Kickboxing. I did it just with a credit card. I mean, show you how crazy I was, huh? Uh, but uh, I was real successful. I was the Javier menace of those days. I was the guy where the fighters would come to me and, and they would train. And uh, 18 years ago, you know, I had, a, had my dream to be the best cut man in the business. I was a and when I had my school, I was a trainer, I was a promoter, I was an agent for the guys, I was a man, I did it all. But I wanted to be a cut man and I uh, got a job transfer, uh, transferred my school to my students and uh, packed up my family in a U-Haul and I drove to Las Vegas and, uh, you know, and I knew Dana White. Dana White, myself, Don House, which is the other cut man, we were in the gyms. We are training fighters and, you know, and telling Dana and, and House how many times has even you, Joe, I'm sure you've been through the same steps. Is how many times your wife says, you know, you got to get a job because this isn't paying the bills, right? Uh, but years go by, and I hadn't seen Dana for about a year, and I'm doing a K-1 at the Bellagio, and he asked for my business card, and uh, next day he called me and said, look, man, we bought the UFC. You know, you want to come on board? And uh, he changed my life. When was the moment you realized, I want to be a cup man? I mean, there's got to be something that said, no, i got to help these dudes out. Yeah, that was during, uh, you know, during my kickboxing days, you know, and uh, I was working with kickboxers plus boxers in, out of the Sacramento area, and uh, I just, you know, I, I saw these veteran cut men, and I tried to learn from these guys, and as a matter of fact, one cut man, I asked him what he was doing, he did a great job, and, and he told me F off, you know, he said, hey, I'm taking this to my grave, but that was the mentality of these cut men in the old days, and that right there, it changed my whole philosophy on, on what I wanted to do, I know I wanted to be the best cut man in the business, uh, but I also wanted to teach and you know learning baseball nobody really taught us the the fundamentals that I know now in baseball to really get to that next level uh, so education is something that I, I wanted to bring forward and and I think I've done a pretty good job. Big John McCarthy told me before I spoke with you that when you sit stitched down you have to ask the types of cuts the location of the cuts and the importance of understanding what Stitch has to do in less than 60 seconds because it's not really a minute, it's less than 60 yeah, seconds. Is, yeah, pretty much. So, how quickly do you have to assess that cut? Like, is it when you're literally walking into the cage or the ring, you already know what you're doing? Yeah, you know, Joe, that's a good question. And, you know, throughout that, whether it's boxing or whether it's MMA, throughout that whole fight, my whole focus is the face. You know, and when I'm working with a fighter, I say, look, you know, you take every part of his body, that face is mine. And my whole focus is on that. But once I see a cut, uh, those are things that you have to evaluate as you go. And once you get in there, you clean that, that cut, then you assess it as you go. But, you know, things you got to look at is, is whether there's going to be any nerve damage, whether you, you pop a vein and, 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 you know, you pop a vein, you're going to have excessive bleeding. You know, if you damage some nerve tissue, you can get double vision. Uh, you know, depending on the, if the blood's going to get in the eyes. Those are in the eyes. Those are the things you have to evaluate as you're really working on the cut. But at the same time, you have to keep that composure where the fighter does not understand what I understand that, you know what, uh, pretty bad cut, man. You know, I mean, I've seen cuts where you can literally see the skull, and, uh, but those don't freak me out anymore. You know, those, uh, uh, and one of the things that really makes a good cut, man, is the, the confidence and just the composure, and I think I, 
uh, I demonstrate that pretty well. How long did it take you before you realized, I can do this, I'm not going to get sick over this, my stomach is not going to turn, I can do this, this is my job? Well, you know, I uh, really haven't told anybody my secret, but I, I'll tell you, you know, uh, the mental game is such a strong game. Right? I mean, that's for anything that we all do, all any sport or anything like that. But I used to tell myself, you know what, it's not my cut. So keep relaxed, do what you have to do. And I understand I have 50 seconds. If I could steal five more seconds, I have 55 seconds. But that was my mentality at that point that it's not my cut. Uh, now that I have that confidence, I mean, I've worked just about every cut and every part of the face and, and the head and all that, that I understand that that's not a problem anymore. My, my concern is to give that guy that confidence, looking at him eye to eye, uh, uh, even talking to him if I have to, and let him know that he's going to be okay. You take a look at some of the cuts that you've seen. and, and what I mean, the goal is one more round. That's your theory. Yes. One more round. Uh, have you ever been in a situation where you told the doctor, just let me do this, I can do this? Yeah, you know, uh, the people always ask me, what's the biggest cut? That's one of the main questions. But the bloodiest fight that I've ever worked was Jay Haran and Jonathan Goulet. And this was at the Hard Rock. And, and it wasn't a big cut. Jay Haran took a knee and he popped that big vein that we all have when you get excited. Well, he popped that vein and it was just gushing out, right? So Mark Ratner, which works with the UFC now, was the uh, uh, commissioner at that time. And Dr. Hermansky was the ringside physician. And they're both covered in blood. So they're asking me, Stitch, can you work on it? Oh, yeah, sure, no problem. I got it. I got it. You know, so I'm putting direct pressure on that cut. And, and I let go on. It's, it's OK. You know, and then I, I mix adrenaline and Vaseline together. And I use that as a final topical. So once I put it on there, that blood started seeping right through that Vaseline, and I knew I was in trouble. You know? and, uh, so they let the fight continue a little bit, but there was just so much blood. That fight literally made me nauseated for about 45 minutes. Just that metallic smell of blood, it, it kind of got to my stomach. Uh, but Jay Haran is very proud that, uh, that he's part of my story. He has the mat. He has the mat. At it's Extreme a, Couture. It, it's Extreme Couture, absolutely. Crazy. Um, there's a science. To being a cut man, or in Swayze's case, a cut woman, but there's some, some sort of education behind it. Did you ever read up on stuff to say this is what I'm going to use to constrict this or that, or like you said, the, the, the mixture of the Vaseline and stuff? Did you ever, ever have to sit back, especially in your day where the internet was probably kind of null and void, and sure. pull out the books? Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, I, I read books on, on you know what easiest way to coagulate. You know, cold, direct pressure is it, nature's way. You know, just. You get cut, you just put your finger on it and, and the blood coagulates itself. You know? So you let nature help you as you go along, uh, plus the uh, medications that are authorized by the commissions, the adrenaline chloride, which is a vessel constrictor, the uh, avitine, which is a coagulant, same as thrombin, uh, quick aid, which is a hemostatic gauze pad that dehydrates the blood. Those are the things that I did research on. And, and, uh, and, and you know, once you understand the fundamentals of what they do, when you apply them, you have to literally Put your mind into that application, into what you're using, and you you just kind of see it working in there, but you have to visualize that as you're doing that. This might be a silly question, but I'm going to throw it to you anyways. Have you ever been on the street before and seen... Okay, i got to tell you a story. Yeah. Here we go. There yeah, I'll go. tell you a story, man. Yeah, I'll tell you, i got stories for everything. I think it was UFC... It was we did the first fight at the Staples Center. Great story, man, I tell you. And, and we're walking out, and I was with Tap Out that time, so they invited the cut men to their after fight dinner. So we're walking out of the Staples Center and all these fans are around me and Josh Barnett is there and we're taking pictures and what have you not. And to my side, a couple guys are kind of wrestling, not older guys, you know. So I think, okay, you know, they're messing around, but obviously one of the guys was drunker than the other guy. So the son of one of the guys pushes the guy and he slams his head on the cement and gets knocked out and he's five feet away from me. And I said, oh, my God, I put my bag down. I go and I look at him, and he's knocked out. Finally, he comes through, and he has a UFC cut right here on his eyebrow. And I'm like, oh, my God. So Don House gives me the stuff, and I'm working on him, right? And he's drunk, and finally he comes through, and he's standing up, and I'm putting the pressure that I would on a cut, and he looks at me, and he says, Stitch, I can't believe you're working on me. <laughs> and all these people are taking pictures, and I think it came out on YouTube or something like that. And, uh, and I told the guy that's with him, I said, look, man, Keep that direct pressure on him. Take him to the hospital. He's going to need stitches. But that was a, that was a fun moment, man. Crazy. Do you, feel, do you feel like you only had 50 seconds to clean him up? Yeah, well, you know, it, it was, it was, but it was, what was 
so funny about it is you know people were shooting with their cameras and their videos and all that and taking pictures during that moment and uh, but just his expression a stitch I can't believe you working on me you know it was a uh, and I'd love to meet him one of these days and say damn you know you're the guy that took care of this cut you're a movie star yeah it's crazy huh? <laughs> tell yeah. me about that you know I've, I've done four movies and uh, when when I left RJ Reynolds years ago the day that I left I got a call to do an audition for a movie called play it to the bone Woody Harrelson Antonio Banderas and uh, because I was so disciplined at work I was working with my boss that last day of work and I figured it'd be an eight to five job and the interview was at three o'clock so I'm nervous throughout the whole day and finally about 10 o'clock I said you know Augie I got an opportunity to do a movie. I said, I, I'm just here to sign you out. I went and did the interview and uh, got the movie, got my part. I played myself in the movie. I wanted to be Antonio Banderos cut man because we're Latino with Latino, right? But Chuck Bodak, which was the legendary cut man, which was, you know, my mentor, got in front of me and, and got the position. So I had Woody Harrelson. And, uh, but the relationship I had with Woody Harrelson was great. And then in the movie, he's the one that gets cut. And the, the trainer and the promoter saying, don't worry about it. You got the best cut man in the business. So Chuck Bodak is saying, God, you're lucky, you know, you got that position. And then uh, I did uh, Rocky Balboa. You know, they called me. I had a, I had a, I was working with Fabrice Tioza, the the cruiserweight champ of the world from from France, and he had a fight scheduled in Paris. And then the week after, I was going to work with Audley Harrison, the heavyweight out of England, that won a gold medal. And I got a call, and at first I said, No, I can't do it because I have these two fights. And I called my wife at home uh, at work. And I tell her, I said, look, I got the opportunity to do a movie, but I can't do it. She goes, are you crazy? He goes, Rock is an American icon. You know, you have to do it. And God, I thought there for about 30 minutes. And I, I literally, I was on the computer negotiating with Audley Harrison's people, the fees, the so everything. And for about 30 minutes, I just sat there and I said, you know what, she's right. And I deleted it. And I said, look, man, here's what's happened between our last conversation and now. And they understood. And, uh, and it turns out that Tiozo's fight got canceled. So, you know, somebody up there likes me. And uh, so I did that. And then obviously, you know, uh, Kevin James, here comes the boom with Boss Rutten. And, uh, you know, that was a great, great uh, time. I had a super time. And I'm ready to do another one, man. You also worked with Kevin James. What was that like? Well, you know, uh, my wife's a big fanatic fan of Kevin James. So am I. I mean, we see his movies even to now. I mean, the, his, his program. Uh, but when I got, I was doing a fight and... Frank Caracci, who's the director, comes up to me. I, actually, he's in the audience. And he said, hey, I want to take a picture with you. Oh, no, I want to take a picture of you. I said, no, nah, let's take one together. I didn't know who he was. And he said, hey, listen, man, you know, how would you like to be in a movie with Kevin James? I said, yeah, I'd love to. But you know what, man? Kevin James is, is a super, super guy. And when I told my wife that I got a part in the movie with Kevin James, it was, it was a complete honor. And, uh, you know, so I, I go to Boston and, and uh, the the filming is in Lowell, Massachusetts, which is like 65, 45-minute eh, drive. And, and, but we're staying in Boston. So Boss Rutten, which is one of my favorite guys, I've known him since the days of Pride, he had his Porsche flown over there and, or delivered over there because he was going to be there filming for like three months. So him and I in the mornings would shoot up to Lowell and train. And, and uh, looking at Kevin, just he looked tremendous. you know. So, but, but what's really ironic is in the movie, when I get the script, I'm reading it, and the storyline says Kevin James gets cut. They call me in. I start working on him and his line to me, which is a million dollar line, is, oh, Stitch, I'm a big fan of yours. I can't believe you're working on me. What a week I'm having. So I said, well, you know what? I've done a couple movies and, you know, I've done a storyline. I know there's a little bit of residuals here, residuals there. If you say a word or two, right? So I had to line that up. I said, I have to say something. You know, I, so I go and I get close to shooting the, the our segment there. And, Kevin comes up to me and says, "Well, you Stitch, you know, we uh, we gotta have you say something. You know, what what are you thinking about? You know, what what do you think we used to say?" And so I'm kind of playing the, mm, I don't know, but what if we say something like, "Welcome to the UFC." Oh, that's great. He said, "That's awesome, man. That's a good." So that's the take, right? Well, during the the shoot, and we only did one shoot, which was great. I uh, I added a little bit more to it. So he comes up and he looks at me. Ah, oh, Stitch, can't believe you're working on me. I'm a big fan of yours. What a week I'm having. And I clean them up and poop. Then I give them a slap. Bam! Welcome to the UFC. And then I walk away. And uh, nobody knew I was going to do that slap. You know, it's kind of improv. I think is what they say in Hollywood. But once I did that, everybody started laughing. Everybody. And he says, "Man, that's a take." You know. So 
Perfect. That was my acting job. What do you do for fun, though? Because you travel so much. You, yeah. you make my travel schedule look light, let's be honest yeah. for a second. You travel a lot. It's nonstop. So what do you do to just <laughs> relax the mind? Yeah, well, you know, when I'm, not, uh, when I'm not traveling, which is just about, I mean, in April, I was home for three days. You know, I mean, and I, I went to Germany. I went to Oakland. I went to Abu Dhabi. I went to Quebec. I went to uh, Washington, D.C., and then I went back to Germany. And, uh, but this is what I love doing, you know, and, and my family really understands it. And the days that I'm not doing that, which is often, I spend all my time with my wife and my son and, and my family and uh, because they sacrificed so much for what I did. Plus, I love spending time with them, you know, and uh, so we, uh, we love going to the movies, you know. Uh, but with all this jet lag and all that, I'll, <laughs> I'll fall asleep. <laughs> but it's the best sleep ever, you know. Uh, but, yeah, I, I spend all my time with my family. That's what I do. I, 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 they deserve that, and I deserve that. The, you know, I, I can get into the science of Vaseline on the face. I'll let you explain it, but the question I get asked is, why do they put Vaseline on the fighters' faces? Yeah. Well, you know what? I'm going to tell you. Let's just really talk about that, Joe, because the, the theory behind the Vaseline is that the punches will slip off, and it minimizes the possibility of a fighter getting cut. But, man, fighters get cut all the time, so I don't even really know if that theory works. I'm going to continue using it because I don't know if it was... You know, it started years ago, uh, but that's the theory behind it, but I don't know if it works. You know, so, I don't know. Swayze Valentine. Yes. Your thoughts on Swayze? Uh, you know, it's uh, ambitious, definitely. You know, uh, uh, you know, she definitely wraps a good hand. Uh, you know, and, and it's, it's a growing sport, and you know, now you know, we work with Invicta. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a dual gender type of position. Uh, but, you know, she's, she needs to get in the trenches and, and uh, you know, do some work. And, you know, she's, uh, she's worked the smaller events and, and all that. But, uh, you know, getting into the UFC, what we call UFC cuts, you know, those are a little bit higher than, than you would the smaller ones. But it's going gonna, it's gonna to take some time for her to, uh, you know, to really master uh, the game of, of rapping hands is one thing. That's 50% that's of it. But working cuts uh, in less than 50, 55 seconds is, is another one. That's something she's going to have to master also. She's gone through some, some tribulations to, to get where she's at. Sure. Um, are you surprised by that? I'm, I'm personally not because it's obviously a male-dominated sure. uh, industry, but, I mean, good for her. Yeah, oh, yeah, no, absolutely. Listen, I've gone through them, you know, and I'm a male, you know, and uh, uh, so those are the things that really will make a person thick anyway, thick-skinned. And, uh, and I think, you know, you need that. I'm, I'm sure through your growth and where you're at now, you know, you've had people that uh, have tried to knock you down at the knees and all that. But those are things that, uh, that we go through that are growing pains. And, and if you could withstand that, uh, then, then you have a better chance of, of getting to the top. Somebody wants to become a cut man or a cut woman. I get that question asked all the time. And here's my answer to them is, you know, they see what I do and, and, and I, I want to be like Stitch. I get doctors, I get paramedics, I get uh, nurses, I get just regular fans that want to be cutmen, and I get that question all the time. And, uh, but they don't understand that I've been doing this for like 30 years and I've been in the trenches, but here's what I tell them is, number one, you got to spend hours and days and weeks and months and years in the gym being a fighter and learning how to be a fighter, and you learn your trait as you go and you, and, and you practice, you practice, you practice, you practice, and you have to give for so many years, you have to give your time and your effort, and if you do it for the money, you do it for the wrong reason. You know, so uh, that's the advice I give them, and that's how you weed them out. Any fighters out there that when you're assigned their corner, you're like, eh, it's gonna be a lot of work tonight. Yeah, there's, uh, <laughs> yeah, there's, there's, there's been some fighters that, uh, you know, you kind of punch them here and, and they get cut here. Uh, you know, it, it happened in boxing. You know, there was, in boxing I had Raul Marquez and Johnny Tapion and, and Rocky Gannon at one time. <clears throat> and Miguel Diaz, which is one of the top cut men in boxing, he said, you know, you're lucky. You get all the bleeders, you know. But uh, uh, here in, in, in the mixed martial arts, yeah, you know, there's guys that, that you know you're going to work on, you know, and, uh, and you prepare for that. So. BJ Penn was a guy that used to never get cut. George was a guy that used to never really swell up. No. Is, there, is there something to say that as, as you know, the skin should toughen, it should, but then you get scar tissues and stuff like that? Can you tell beforehand when as a guy's getting, or a girl I guess, gets older in their career, it's going to be more difficult to work on them, or at least there's going to be more work for guys like yourself? In between rounds? Well, not, not necessarily. You know, Anderson Silva, a good example, when he fought Chael Sonnen, he took such a beating, you know, early on <clears throat> that in the first round I walk in, I told Ed Soros, you know, I'm going to go and I'm going to 
just keep him packed at nights in between rounds. And uh, but his texture, you know, he just does it well and all that. But you know what? This game in the mixed martial arts, it it doesn't really skin texture and all that. Yeah, it plays a little bit of a part of it. But it's the elbows and the punches and the knees and the kicks that that really make the difference on on whether you create a cut or not. What do you tell a guy when you're wrapping his hands, or a girl when you're wrapping his hands in the corner room because their mind is tunnel vision right now? Oh God, you know, I've had guys I walk in, I start wrapping their hands, I've had guys cry. And, and you know, I don't tell names, but uh, there's guys that, but I understand. You know, and I'm saying when you're in that field, you have to understand. And, you know, this one guy is crying like a baby, and I just, I've started wrapping his hands, and I stopped. And I just, I let him cry, and then I said, look, man, don't worry about it. You know, I'm here to take care of you. And, you know, once I finish wrapping his hands, his confidence level gets up there. He gives me a hug, you know, tells me he loves me, goes out there and wins the fight. You know, but uh, Frank Mir really said it best, and he says, when I see Stitch walking in the dressing room, my stomach just drops because I know it's time to fight. Vitor Belfort says, you know, when I, Stitch comes in, whether he's working my corner or not, he brings that calming effect to me. And, uh, and I think that's, that's what I do. You know, these guys, they have a lot of confidence in me, and, and uh, I'm, I'm like their father, man, when they fight. And, uh, and they're my children. It's weird. So the really cool thing about this is the mentality of the fighter as the day progresses because when Stitch shows up, you know, you put your hands up, Stitch is done, Bert's walking around. We roll it, and you know that when Bert, yeah. Bert's the horn. Yeah, 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 now Bert is, Bert's yeah. the one that, that pulls, like if you're in the, the horse races, you open that gate, he's the one that opens that gate. I'm the one that puts the, like the old gladiator days, I'm the guy that puts the armor on them, you know, in the, in the dungeon before they walk out to the Coliseum. And uh, that's the new modern version of a modern day gladiator, but that's what I do, you know. I get them ready for battle. There's certain different personalities. You know, some guys are tense, some guys are relaxed. Uh, John Jones, I go and start wrapping his hands, and uh, I ask him if he wants a knockout rap or the tap out rap. He wants the tap out rap, right? And uh, so I'm wrapping his hands, and he's over there videotaping me. Ah, this is Stitch Duran, he's wrapping my hands, and he's so relaxed and all that. And, and then we finish up and all that. And, and, you know, Vladimir Klitschko's the heavyweight champ of the world, one of the guys I work with. So John Jones had always mentioned, you know, I want to fight Vladimir. So I got him on video. I said, well, you know, tell me so I could tell Vladimir, you know. So he tell me, oh, Vladimir, I want you and all that. But these are the fun things that we do, you know. And, but that's how I relax them and that's how they relax is by uh, having these little stories like that. Uh, Randy Couture, you know, same thing with him. When I used to wrap his hands, he was such, such a relaxed guy, you know. And, just, and we would just sit there and, and just talk and... And I'd ask him questions and how you doing and just general conversation, you know. And uh, but I tell you what, man, it's also often when I finish wrapping these guys' hands, you can see their confidence level just get to that point where they up there. Man, I get that hug and I get a kiss to the cheek and stitch. I love you, man. You know. And uh, but Johnny Hendricks, it's uh, you know he grows that beard once he once he gets booked, right? And uh, we're in the dressing room uh, after his fight and. And we're talking about it. So I clip a little piece of hair off him. Ah, let me clip some off, you know, all right. Well, and then he fought, uh, it was the fight before George St. Pierre. He ends up, Carlos. He ended up winning with a knockout. So in the middle of the ring, I cut off some of his beard, just as a little trademark, you know. And uh, well, that was that's Catman. Martin Catman. Yeah. Yeah, so that was, uh, that was, you know, some of the little fun things that I have with that. Uh, the Brazilian fighters, you know, they, uh, they just, you know, to me, they just show me so much respect, you know, and that's, it's a great feeling, man. You've got to be there. What does it feel like internationally? Because I've been with, yeah. been with you in Japan, yeah. Canada, yeah. States. Oh, yeah. it's crazy. You know, my, my first trip to Brazil, I always wanted to go to Brazil. I go through customs. I go to customs, and I get to the custom agent, and the first thing he says, Steve, bom venido a Brazil. I said, wow, man, that's, that's pretty awesome. And, you know, we'll walk around with uh, some of the officials and all that, and we're doing tours. and. I see a policeman there, and he looks at me, and he goes like this, you know, that's you and see, oh, that's right. And then there's a mother. We're at the at the beach area where they have the little palapas and all that, and she's there with her family and all that, and she does the same thing. So I go over there and start talking to her, and all of a sudden she pulls out her breast, man, and starts breastfeeding her baby. And I look at that, and I kind of did the Michael Jackson walking backwards. You know? That kind of got me off guard. I didn't know what to do. I was like, oh, you know, just a little shock syndrome, but that's, that's how it rolls. And, in Japan, when we, you know, we used to go to Japan for Pride and all that, my first trip back to Japan with the UFC, I'm walking into the arena with my bucket and all that, and I hear all the fans in the audience saying, Stitch-san, 
state sign. And listen, I mean, I got chills right now just talking about it, but I ended up with chills all over my body, man. It was, it was, it was a mind-blowing experience. What is the cut man's toolkit? Uh, well, the two kits is, you know, obviously, you know, we use the adrenaline chloride 1-1000, one, one the, the medications, and uh, the avatine and the thrombin, those are very hard to use. Uh, avatine is more like cotton candy, it's very hard to use, so we don't even use it anymore. We use Quick Aid, which is a hemostatic gauze pad. Those are the two medications uh, that we use. The, the KO swell, uh, that's the iron that we use for eliminating, maintaining the swelling. Uh, ice pack, Vaseline. Uh, definitely gloves. You know, if you notice uh, in boxing, you'll see guys with the swabs in their mouth and in their ears. I've eliminated that in the UFC. We don't do that at all because to me it's nasty. And that's that educational part that I was telling you about, Joe, uh, that I brought to the table. You know, we have a wrist wrap where uh, we put the swabs in there and, and we keep them as, as clean as possible because you're dealing with open wounds. Uh, and those, those are your basic tr trades, uh, tools of the trade. You know, we have little wet towels that we use to wipe up the blood and and all that, but this, we're pretty basic uh, in the trenches type of work. How much longer are you gonna be doing this for? Oh man, I'm gonna die in the ring, brother. You know, I'll tell you that. I, uh, you know, it's, uh, I don't know, maybe that's a hard way of it, but I. Uh, that's it's, that's it's, realness, that's yeah, realness yeah, though, No, right? no, absolutely, I, I, I'm healthy, I feel great. You know, I'm 62 years old and, uh, you know, uh, God, if I could do it, you know, the, the legends in boxing, you know, the Chuck Bodaks, the Ace Moradas, Eddie Alianos, Joe Souza's, you know, Rafael Garcia that works with Mayweather, they got their claim to fame in their 80s, 70s, and 80s. And, you know, I, I feel I'm in that position right now, but I, I'd like to stretch it out as, as much as, 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 as somebody will let me do it, you know. Mm -hmm.